Oh, good evening, everyone. If you're visiting here, we're busy with a series which we've entitled Life Coach. Now, in a practical sense, what a life coach does is he gets you unstuck when you're in trouble. So you might uh, get a life coach to help you if you've got trouble in your relationships or at work, etc. Now, we know the Holy Spirit is our life coach. And he takes us on and he guides us and he helps us get unstuck on our spiritual journey. And so uh, what we're looking at really in this series is how you become spiritually mature. And we recognize that from the moment we're born again until we meet Jesus, we're on this journey of transformation into Christ-likeness. What's a mature believer? A mature believer is someone who is increasingly like Christ. So Christ be formed in us, is what Paul said to the Galatians. Or to the Corinthians, he said, to be transformed into the image and the likeness of Jesus. Now the reality is, as you progress, you might have been saved for 10, 15 years. It's possible to get stale. It's possible to get stuck. And we say, how, how do we get stuck? And, and what is it that helps us through? And so we've looked at things like this. At the very beginning of your journey, some people get stuck right there. And the reason they get stuck there is that they just obey God partially. The Bible says, believe and be baptized. I challenge you to go into Scripture and find anywhere in the, in the book of Acts where believers believed, and then three or four years later they decided, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe we should take him up on his offer to get baptized and get baptized then. They believed, and then they got baptized. And that radical move of following Jesus ensures that the trajectory from start is strong and healthy. So we dealt with that first week. Then we looked at people getting stuck because they just put the Bible down. You'll get stuck that way spiritually because you'll start to listen to what other people think. You will start to take your cue from the world and other places, and you'll take a serious detour in your faith. So we spoke a few Sunday nights ago about having a love and discipline for the Word. And that helps us in our spiritual journey. We talked about getting stuck when you get hurt and isolate yourself and decide you're going to do your faith by yourself and you'll just pop in every now and again to church. Church is not perfect. It could be that it has hurt you. But if you adopt that position where you're just going to do your faith by yourself, you'll get stuck. And so we spoke about getting connected. Then this morning we looked at serving. People get stuck when the whole point of their faith is them. They become selfish. They start to center everything in their spirituality around themselves and their own well-being. Instead, Jesus sets himself as an example and the way to give your life away. And so if you want to become more like Jesus, we saw this morning that that journey is a servant journey. And then tonight, we're dealing with this issue. Some people get stuck because they stop talking to the Lord. Some people get stuck because they only start talking to the Lord when they come to formal meetings like this. Some people get stuck when prayer stops. They saved, they're going to heaven, but things stall, get stale. And so we were going to devote a whole evening to preaching on this subject and inspiring you. But we felt to do something a little different here this evening. So hang on to your seatbelts. Vic Roberts is going to come and preach for a moment and give us a biblical motivation for prayer. And then we're going to stand and we're going to pray like we've never prayed before on a Sunday night. I, I really am believing tonight that we're going to knock on the windows of heaven, and we're going to 
be praying as Jesus prayed, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. You young guys who've been worshiping radically here, if you have something passionate on your heart tonight to pray about, you'll have an opportunity to take the mic. So don't, don't worry if you're visiting here this evening. No one's going to come and throw this mic. No one's going to expose you, put the be spotlight on you. But we do want to call out together to God in prayer. And I'm trusting that tonight will be like a kickstart for many of us to take our prayer to another level. Uh, it doesn't make you a first-rate Christian if you pray more than somebody else. But what it does do is that when you engage with heaven, uh, it gets you through the mud that you've got stuck in. One of the things we're going to do this evening is we're going to beam in one of our church planters uh, from England. And we're going to talk to them. We're going to pray for, for England. We're going to pray for many things. But uh, before we do, this is Big Robert. Why don't you welcome him? Courage your guy. Evening. 1939, John and Isabel Kuhn, an American couple, go to the Salween Valley in the northwest corner of China. It's up in the mountains. Seven days walk to get to where they're going to be working. Perched precariously on the edge of each of these mountain valleys are tiny little villages. And the gospel starts getting preached into these villages. People get saved. And churches are birthed in these little villages. There was a village called Three Clan Village. Yes, there were three clans there. And yes, they started fighting. And so this couple goes into this church to spend a few days there to try and reconcile what is happening what is tearing this little church apart. And they spend several days there. They unpack the scriptures. They, they encourage them. And nothing happens. And the day they're about to leave, they have one last meeting. They walk into the meeting. They, they, they throw out their hearts. They beg in these people, under God, please make peace with one another. And all of a sudden, one of those that's fighting stands up and he starts confessing, and he starts repenting, and his heart just opens up. And then one by one, they follow until the biggest protagonist, that one which is causing the most trouble, stands up, and suddenly reconciliation comes. As this couple walks out of this church, Isabel turns to her husband and says, that was supernatural. You spoke beautifully, quietly, but it wasn't your words. Something happened. Someone prayed. Fast forward several months. And they receive a letter from home. And this is what happened. There was a lady in her kitchen. She was working in her kitchen when suddenly on her heart, God impresses on her, pray for John and Isabel in China. She gets on the phone. She phones a blind friend of hers in her home. She says, we need to pray. The friend phones another friend and says, please pray. These three ladies in their kitchen, in their sitting room, halfway around the world, pray for a couple in China. At the end of it, they suddenly feel God has answered their prayer. They jot down the date and the time. And when they look and they compare the date and the time, it was the exact moment where God broke in to that meeting in China. Three people praying halfway around the world and God moves and God changes situations. Friends, when we pray, things change. I'd like to rewind a little bit from 1939 and I'd like to rewind to the year 40 AD, just a few years after Jesus had been crucified and he's risen from the dead. And you find the story in Acts chapter 12. And what happens in Acts chapter 12 is it starts off, and I'm just going to read a few verses, and then 
We'll have a look at it. It says in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw this, met with the approval of the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. This chapter starts with this scenario. James is dead. Peter is locked up in jail, and Herod is sitting triumphant on the throne. You can read on in Acts chapter 12. At the end of Acts chapter 12, this is the scenario. Herod is dead, Peter is free, and the word of God is triumphant. How does it go from a situation that is bound up, imprisoned, no hope, to a situation of freedom, a situation where God is triumphant, and we find the key in Acts chapter 12, verse 5. And it's a simple phrase that says simply this, but the church was earnestly praying. I'd like you all to say that together with me. But the church was earnestly praying. The church prayed, and God broke in. And that phrase, but the church was earnestly praying, we can break it up into two parts. And the first part is, but the church. And if you go through the book of Acts and you start looking, it starts giving you a picture of what compromises, but the church. And I'm going to just pick up on a few things of but the church. Because in that but the church, there are no names, no faces, no heavyweights, just simply but the church. Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says, They joined together constantly in prayer, along with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mothers were included. Mothers formed part of but the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Children were part of that. Acts chapter 16, verse 14, One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. Rich businesswomen were included in that. Acts chapter 21 verse 9. Philip had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Friends, scripture doesn't say he had four daughters. It stresses he had four unmarried daughters. Single ladies, you are part of this. But the church was earnestly praying. Acts 22, verse 3. We read about a professor. His name was Paul. Studied under the the top scholar at the time, a professor. Highly educated people. And then we read in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. They realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. Professors and unschooled. Ordinary men. Acts chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion. That's a soldier. Just a hardworking, simple man. And Acts chapter 9, a guy called Ananias, who was reluctant. When God said go, he was, I I don't want to go. I I don't want to do that. God says go, a reluctant man, but the church. Mothers, children, business people, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, but the church. And the second part of it was earnestly praying. See, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, it says they join together constantly in prayer. And then you and I come along and say, I can't make prayer meetings. I'm too busy. I've got other commitments. I've got other things. Or uh, it just doesn't fit in with that soapy that I'm watching on Tuesday nights. Or it just, I've got other things. They all join together constantly in prayer. 
Deuteronomy 32, verse 30, beautiful scripture, it says, one puts a thousand to flight, two puts 10,000 to flight. And then we come along and we say, but if I come to prayer meeting, I never make a contribution. But you came, we are 10,000 stronger. But when I pray, I only pray quietly under my breath. We are 10,000 stronger. I never make a contribution. You are t- we are 10,000 stronger. I get distracted with my little kid that is running around the whole time during prayer meeting. We are 10,000 stronger. But the church was earnestly praying. Let's fast forward a few years to the year 2009, to One Life Church. In 2009, One Life Church had the south site and we had the north site. And we felt God say, it's time to plant the west site. And so we are going for it. We are keen, we are, yes, we are gonna plant our west site. There was a property which we could use. We cleared a piece of land. We were praying on this piece of land But behind us, there was this magnificent building, just beautiful for a church. There was one slight little problem. There was a factory in this building. And they had a lease that ran for, I think it was three more years, something like that. But the church was earnestly praying. And we were praying, oh God, we're going to start a church here. Lord, provide for us. And Lord, if it's possible... Man, that would be a nice building behind us right there. But Lord, bless that factory. Bless them. You know what happened? Over a two-month period, that the orders started coming in so abundantly to that factory that their premises got too small for them to use. Within two months, they had to move in larger premises, and the West meets in that factory right now. But the church was earnestly praying. Let's rewind. But this time, let's go even further back. The year is roughly 1200 BC. Joshua, taking the promised land. Joshua chapter 10, verse 9 to 15. The Amorites... Joshua gets into this, um, he, he joins up with this group that he shouldn't have, and he gets, he shouldn't have done it, but he makes a, a covenant with them, and, and, and he, ups, he upholds this covenant, and suddenly the Amorites come and they attack, and this is what happens. It says, Josh, all night they marched from Gilgal, and Joshua took the Amorites by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to some place and some other place. And as they fled before Israel on the road, down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them. And more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. Just a little aside. It's amazing when we step out like that for God and God breaks in, He does a hang of a lot more than you and I can. And the story continues, and what happens is Joshua realizes that God has promised them victory. But there's one small problem. These Amorites are now starting to feel like they're getting defeated. They're going to start disappearing, and sometime soon the sun is going to go down, and when darkness comes down, they are going to disappear into darkness. And so what happens is, Joshua realizes, well, I'm going to take days and weeks and maybe months hunting these oaks down to finish this job. And Joshua prays probably one of the boldest prayers we've probably ever heard. And we read it here, and he says this in verse 12. It says, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon. And it says in verse 13, so the son stood still. Friends, that little passage of scripture should give us so much courage. It says in James that the prayer of a righteous person is 
powerful and effective. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3 that God hears the prayers of the righteous. If you and I are saved, we are righteous before God. And God hears our prayers and they're powerful and effective. And Joshua stands up and he prays a righteous man before God and he says, son, stand still. Friend, this is why that should give you and I so much courage. Because Joshua prayed the wrong thing. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. But what we know today is the sun does not move. The earth rotates and the sun stands still all the time. Joshua should have prayed, earth stop spinning, and then things would have stand still. He even prayed the wrong prayer, and God hears him, and the earth stops spinning, and they win an almighty battle. Lord, I don't know what words to use, Lord, but Joshua prayed, sun stand still. Lord, I don't know how to pray. Joshua got the words wrong, but God saw his heart, God saw his faith, and the sun stand still. And Israel won a mighty, mighty battle. But the church was earnestly praying. Let's fast forward one last time. To the 18th of March, 2018. And let's go to about 7.30 a.m. Three men met in a little lounge in the corner just over there behind the black curtain. And for about 10 minutes, middle-aged guy, two guys just out of school, young guys, spent some time praying. And they prayed specifically to God, asking God to put a few things on their heart and to pray. One of the things they prayed was, Lord, we pray for people to get baptized. At that moment, no one was getting baptized today. Just after that, Jonathan went to someone and said, I want to get baptized tonight. Before the service started, nine o'clock this morning, a lady had come up and said, I want to get baptized. I can't do it today, but I'll do it next week. But the church was earnestly praying. Those three guys prayed for people to get saved. I'm trusting if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, That before you walk out of those doors, you are going to surrender to that most loving, amazing king of kings in the whole world. But this morning, people got saved right here. But the church was earnestly praying. They prayed for people to get healed. And they prayed specifically for blood disorders. During the service, a man stands up and he says, God has put it on my heart to pray for people this morning in the service, and particularly people who have heart problems. The heart pumps blood. I don't know, haven't heard yet if anyone has got healed. But three guys sitting there pray, and someone stands up that didn't know what was going on, and he says, God is saying the same thing. But the church was earnestly praying. On the 19th of March, 2018, yes, that's tomorrow, what are you going to pray about? And what are you going to pray about the next day? And what are you going to pray about the day after that? But the church was earnestly praying. The prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. And the ear of the Lord hears the prayers of a righteous person. I'm going to hand back to Grant now. He's going to lead us, I'm not sure how, to pray. But the church was earnestly praying. One of the band can come forward, please. Let's stand, everyone. Those young guys who are worshiping passionately up front, Why don't you come pray passionately? God's stirring your heart to pray and intercede tonight. Come uh, join us up front here.
Don't worry, no one's going to chuck a mic in your hand. But you're within reach of grabbing it and leading us. While these guys are getting themselves ready, the Bible teaches us various ways to pray. I mean, Jesus was asked, teach us to pray. And so he said the Lord's Prayer, and from that moment, people have sort of used it as a type of liturgy. But it's a great method of praying too. Our Father, beginning to worship Him. Holy is your name. Getting your attention toward heaven. And you can move through it that way. I, I want to give you a way that I use in most my personal prayer. The acronym ACTS help, helps me. A C T S ACTS A for adore. We've been adoring God tonight. C for confession. If there's anything on your heart right now that's troubling you, with all eyes closed, just take it before the throne. You know that if you've been up to nonsense, you don't have to go through penance, punishment. Just put it before the throne right now. Because sin, guilt, and that sort of stuff puts an obstruction between you and heaven. God has given us a way for it to be cleansed. As we repent, we confess our sins to Him. He washes them, He forgets them, and He remembers them no more. If there's anything on your heart that's troubling you right now, just present it before the throne. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. A for adore, C for confess, T for thanksgiving. Say thank you. Say, God, there's so much going wrong in my life. I want to go straight into you. Ask me to fix that stuff. Thank Him that you're breathing. You're in a family that loves Him. That He's chosen for you to be born now, the most exciting time in history. That he's put you in this nation. There's a lot you can say about this nation, but I'll tell you one thing. It's not boring. I travel the world. There's some pretty boring places. I want you to thank him right now. Thank him for the little things in your individual lives. Thank him for your families. Thank him for your health. Thank him for your dreams. Thank him for the friends that he's got around you. Thank him that you're living. Thank him that he's found you. Thank him that he's given you a faith. Some of you are thinking negative thoughts right now. Father, I pray that you would fill our hearts to overflowing with thankfulness. Just as best you can from the depths of your heart, begin to thank God for stuff. Your kids, if you have them. If you don't, your parents. You say, God, my my parents weren't too cool. Thank God that he gave you parents. Lord, we thank you for this nation. We thank you for our leaders. We thank you for the church in this land. We thank you for every single saint that is praying right now. We thank you for all those that got saved today. We thank you, Lord God, for the future that you've planned out before us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for those who are standing with us even in countries where things aren't this free. We thank you, Lord God. Thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for our other brothers and sisters and other churches in this nation. Bless them, Lord, we pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for our help. Thank you, Lord, for positioning us in this time and this generation. Thank you, Lord God, for the prophetic words you've spoken over us collectively and individually. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for every young person in this building. I thank you for those who've been walking with you for, that, for, for many, many years. Thank you, Lord, for the thousands and thousands and thousands that have gone before us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
pay for it all. Tea for confess. Tea for thanksgiving. And then what we're going to do now is supplication. Calling out to God in heaven to intervene. The band is going to begin to play. And we are going to begin to intercede. Before we ask you to join together in certain things, whatever the Holy Spirit puts on your heart right now as we begin to worship, in faith, call out to God in heaven. And Lord, I pray now that every issue that's raised before the throne of heaven, that would rise before you, your word says it rises like incense, it rises like an offering, it rises like an the smoke of the altar of sacrifice as it reaches heaven. Lord God, we pray that there would be a response because you are faithful to your word. Lord, as, as prayers and petitions and supplication come before the throne of heaven regarding relationships, I pray that you would supernaturally intervene. Regarding loved ones that are sick, I pray that you would supernaturally intervene. We pray that the kingdom of heaven will be manifest on earth. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. We pray, Lord God. Lift up your voices, friends. Pray for the things that are on your heart. Pray for the things that the Holy Spirit has put there. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you that you speak, Lord. That you're stirring hearts right now to call out for the kingdom of heaven to come. For the rule of God to be in situations and marriages and lives and in bodies and in schools and in workplaces and in family circles. Lord God, we pray for all those that are being lifted to you for salvation right now. We pray that many, many will turn to salvation. Many hardened hearts would be rescued. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Good evening, One Life Church. Um, this past week, a couple of uh, us D-teamers had an amazing privilege of going um, to Dundee on mission. And um, it, was, it was such an incredible privilege. And we were able to just go out and speak to people. Um, my friend Tommy was able to, to preach in front of Dundee High School, in front of about 700 people. And when he gave them response time, when he gave them the chance to know and say, if you want to know Jesus Christ, I want you to raise your hand. I like to call it what we call a wave of salvation. Hands just went up. And at least three quarters of that school gave their lives to Jesus on Wednesday morning. And, um, and, and so that was pretty incredible. And then we were able to go out into a little park and there was a bunch of guys, about six or seven of them, seven of them to be exact. And, and they were sitting there and we could see all the, the, the alcohol around them and, and we could smell the, the weed on them. And, and something inside of me stood and I went and prayed and, and I spoke to them, I kid you not, for about an hour. At the end of that hour, there was tears running down each and every one of them. There were two women and five men and they were all just tears running down their face. And I gave them the chance and I said, if you want to know Jesus Christ, tonight is your night. And each and every single one of them said, I want to know Jesus Christ. They put their beer bottles down and they said, I want to know Jesus Christ. As I was walking away, five more people walked up to me and said, what were you talking about? Please. We want to know what you're talking about. I promise you, for another hour, we sat there speaking to five more people. And at the end, I said, if you want to know Jesus Christ, tonight is your chance. And five more people 
put their beer bottles down and gave their life to Jesus. And if that's not amazing, I don't know what else is. And so tonight, I just want to pray. There's a few more D-teamers going this week to Nguvuma. On Thursday, they're going to Joburg. And, and I feel tonight that, that God's stirring something in our hearts. And He's saying, you know, not only D-teamers should be going on mission, but I should be going on mission. God's saying, you know, we're doing work here in the church and we're comfortable to just be in the church working here. But God's saying we need to go out and seek and save the lost. He's saying we need to go out into the corners of the world where people don't know Jesus. So I want to pray tonight over these missions. If you would just raise your voices with me and pray over these missions that God would stir something in your heart. Father God, tonight I pray and I lift up the Ingwabuma and the Joburg mission, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that they will go out, that they will have courage, Jesus, to go out and speak to people. Father, I pray that you would just lift them, give them a boldness as they speak to people and let them know about you, Jesus Christ. I pray for the miracle of salvation, Jesus. I pray that we get the privilege to go out and speak your word, Jesus Christ, to just spread the gospel, Father God. And I pray tonight that there's people here, there's people here that are sitting here in their comfort zones. They don't want to go out and sleep in a tent or, or eat food out of a can. But Father, I pray that you'll just push them, Father. Press on their hearts that they need to get out there and seek and save the lost, Father God. That they will go out there and they will spend thousands of rand just for that one salvation. And they'll come back knowing that it was all worth it, Jesus. I pray for miracles. Father, I pray for financial miracles, that, that finances will be given to the church, Jesus, that people will be able to go on missions. People will come here with their vehicles and say, here's a vehicle, take it wherever you need, as long as people know that Jesus Christ is Lord. I pray right now, Father, I pray for courage, that people will step out. People will just come out and say, this is me, I wanna go. Father, I pray that you'll just highlight a place, highlight a country, highlight a town, and people will not hesitate. I pray for obedience that we'll get in that car and we will go, Jesus Christ. Knowing that every single cent, every little bit of food that we need will be provided by you, Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Seeing that Vic has been going uh, fast forward and Backtracking. Let me take you back somewhere between 15 and 20 years. A young man arrived in Maritzburg on a type of mission in schools. And he met his wife here. And he got baptized here. I remember his baptism. And he started working as a lawyer. It didn't take long before he was on this team as an elder. And uh, working as an attorney, had some kids, elder here, and then God put on his heart to go and plant a church in England. And so he went across to York. His name is Charles Walters, his wife Kath, two beautiful daughters. And uh, they planted a church. He went across there. He uh, had to write his solicitor's exam, started practicing, only needed to practice for a, just a little bit over a year. And uh, the church was up and running. So he's on the screen tonight, I believe. Is he live? Charlie, <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you, Grant. <laughs> so this is not a prayer meeting night. This is uh, Sunday night church. So hello, girls. Good to see you. Hello. My word. That's Karen and Rach and uh, his wife, Kath. Charlie, I don't know. Can you see anything here? Oh, it's wonderful, man. We've got tears in our eyes. <laughs> and so we've got some young guys that have just come back from mission themselves. And uh, what are all those pictures behind you first to start with? Those are uh, every year we go on holiday and we just uh, tell a story with, with the goodness of God in wow. times of rest and times of play. So those are just family pictures. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, Charlie, uh, maybe just... Give us, because there are a lot of people here who've seen your face now for the very first time and uh, new to church. Uh, I've told them a little bit of your journey, but just tell them what you're experiencing right now. We're experiencing a wonderful shift in the church. Uh, we meet in a secondary school hall, which is about two and a half miles north of the city center. And God's stirring us to 
think of a, of a city center place to express and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord in this beautiful city. Wow. We have uh, families joining us who are versed in the word and who have a heart to reach out and uh, they are strengthening us. Uh, we are also meeting and serving people who live very broken lives and uh, who are in great distress. So it's the whole beautiful, glorious, messy mix. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, wow. Um, we uh, are busy as a church. Uh, there is outreach into care homes. There are three care homes that we go and provide services to. Uh, there's a group for young mums and their children. They go for a walk. They talk about all the different things that crop up. Uh, we have a group that meets with people who have some really long-standing chronic issues and there is a heart of service, a heart of care, a heart of nurture, also some robust discussion with yeah. lifestyle choices. Um, so there is lots of life. Uh, we've got a youth group that meets. There's, a, there's some of them that meet on a Wednesday, some of them meet on a Friday. That's and, fantastic. Uh, Charles, can I butt in there for a sec? I, I'm sure. assuming that um, Corin and Rachel are involved in one of those. <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah, they, they, they're wonderfully part of that. Rach, can you tell us, if we're going to pray for two things for you, what would we be praying for? Um, so I've got exams coming up soon, um, so you can pray for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also just joy in everyday life. Wow, we'll do that for sure. How old are you now, Rach? Fifteen. Sure, there we go. <laughs> And Kath, what can we pray for you? Uh, I think for wisdom in the next season for church, uh, we do feel it's an exciting new thing that God is doing. So we've been going for 10 years now, and there's just something wonderful that has shifted. There's some strong couples coming in, uh, which is exciting for us in terms of leadership. So just for wisdom, for when to perhaps bring them onto eldership with us, that would be amazing. Okay, it's great. And Corin, how old are you now? Thirteen. Thirteen, wow. And give us one thing to pray for you. Um, well, I've just picked the subjects I'm going to take at school, so just that that's been the right choice and that, that will go well. Okay, fantastic. We'll do it for sure. Uh, guys, it's so good to see your faces. And uh, what we're going to do is we'll turn off now and we will get these hundreds of people to stand and pray for the Walters family. Thank you so much, One Life, Southside. We bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so Good to much. see you guys. Bless you. Okay, guys, let's begin to pray for this precious, precious family. Lift up our voices. Let's intercede. Let's trust that God would, would break in. Let's first begin to pray for those new families that... Um, Kath was speaking of. Lord, we thank you for these new people that have been added to them. Thank you for the new leadership that you put around them. And Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom and leadership. Give them wisdom and decision making. Bless them, Lord God. Father, we thank you for these young girls that have upped and relocated and made England their home. We pray that you would bless them as they run their youth groups, that you would bless them in their school, that you would bless them in their leadership. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord God, we pray for all the outreach initiatives everything that they're putting their heart and soul into. Lord, we pray for a release over them. We thank you, Lord, for the miracle of all those who've been saved since they've got there. But Lord, we pray that heaven be opened. We pray, Father, that from them, people would go and plant churches. From them, nations would be touched. Lord, we pray for a great revival amongst the young people around them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I wonder if we pray for those young girls for a moment. The schooling there is slightly different in England. And from what I understand, uh, Rachel, the older one, is, is like a head girl there in, in a school, and it's a big school. And uh, you heard they started two youth groups now. And uh, England's very different to here. The schools are very different. You can't go into an English school and do what our D team did, preach to 700 young people. They just won't let you do it. And so there, there are other ways, but the gospel is no respecter of boundaries or rules that any government puts up. Isn't that true? 
in the deepest, darkest places of persecuted church all over the world, the gospel has got in there. Let's pray for a miracle of the gospel breaking into the schools in York. Well, let us uh, pray for the schools in York. <laughs> Jesus Christ, right now, I lift up the schools in York to you, Father God. And I pray, Father, that your hand will be in there, Father, in the midst of those children, in the midst of those scholars, Father God, that you will be there, Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll just soften the hearts of the principles of the teachers, that they will allow us, Father God, that you will allow the word of Jesus to just penetrate deep within there, Father God. I pray that the government will just see things differently, Father God. They'll see things from, from Jesus' perspective, Father. And I pray, Jesus, right now, that, Father, your hand will be there, Father God. I pray, Father, for a change of hearts, Father, for a softening of hearts, Father God. I pray that uh, it'll, it'll no longer be, be, be uncool to have a Bible. Father, I pray that those youth groups will just thrive in your name, Father. That people will be there every Friday night, whichever night they have a Jesus, they'll be there and they'll be on fire for you, Father. They'll be passionate and burning for your name, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Guys, uh, you know what can strangle a church is uh, lack of generosity. Uh, when, when through whatever it is, fear, what, whatever, it, it can hammer church in, and 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 generosity throws everything open. And uh, we're going to pray for Charles and Kath for 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 finance into their church. And, uh, and we pray that God busts their bank balance open. Uh, you might think it's a carnal thing to pray for. But you love with money. You love with your, what you have. You love with it. God has given it to you to love with. Okay, so we're going to pray. And we're going to pray that the heavens over that church in York burst open burst open with finances from heaven. Let's do it. Pray with me, Father. We pray for that bank balance of that church in your Lord, that you would, you would break it open. Lord, that you would provide so much abundance for them in Jesus' name. Come, pray with me, church. Pray in the generosity of God over that, that church. Father, we pray that you would touch them in Jesus' name. That, Lord, that they, would, they wouldn't even know that, that money would pour in for them, that they would be a conduit of your finance, a conduit of your love, a conduit of, of, of movement in that place. I pray, Lord, that you would unlock for them in Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Lord. Well done, guys. Well done. Charles Walters. The lawyer. He always has his shirt tucked in. And he always has his hair in a side parting. He got married and he had two little girls. He'd bought a home and he was setting up a life for himself. And God said, Go. The only thing he had to go on was that he had a memory of York when he was on rugby tour in his matric year he went on tour through england and he was driving his bus was going through york and he just felt god say to him he was a believer in those days that he's got a future in this city and somehow when we were praying like this in a prayer meeting praying as elders as we pray because god has called us as a church not just to take the gospel to Maritzburg, Dundee, and Joburg, but to the corners of the earth. I wonder if there's another Charlie Walters in this building tonight. And not just one, many. God has been stirring your heart, and it might not be this year. You might still have to meet your wife and have your kid and be reminded of that place. But God has a destiny for every one of you that are here. For some of you, it's this nation. But I believe others, it's the nations of the world. 
Some of us, like myself, come and go from the nations of the world, but the others might be going, you are going. You know, the amazing thing when you talk to Charlie and Kath, they don't talk about coming back here. They don't talk about this being their country. Their daughters sound like English, don't they? Please pray for help for my exams. Whatever exams are. But mom and dad, their hearts have been knit to that God-forsaken place. Let's just close our eyes for a moment. If you believe God is stirring you, I'm not even going to open my eyes. I'm too scared to see in case someone very close to me puts their hands in the sky. But if God is saying, the nations of the earth, just lift your hands toward heaven and say, Lord, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. Lord, I pray that you would Continue and complete the work that you have started. As a church, Lord, we say, we will give our best away. As a church, we say, we will give away our sons and our daughters and our friends and our brothers for the purpose of the kingdom. Lord, I pray that the prayers tonight would be noted in heaven. And there would be a supernatural release that comes and a trajectory with the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit empowering these moves in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. got too much longer friends but the earth is the Lord's and everything in it and you are the Lord's and you're in his hands young guys dream big man I really believe that we've seen nothing yet in terms of God what what God has in store for us as a people thank you Lord it's coming weekend we're opening a church building I want you to put them pop them any building thing up there No, not that one. Surely there's one that's finished. Okay, this site is in the township on the other side of Mpopomeni. And uh, uh, surely there's one that's finished. I promise you, this has a roof on it. It has concrete on the floor. And it has half a wall around it. I wonder if we could pray for that uh, site in Mpopomeni. They are inviting their friends far and wide. You know, you can only ever open a building once. This is their once. Remember when uh, Nehemiah finished his wall? He had the musicians go on top of it. God was glorified in that moment as their wall was finished. This weekend, they're trusting for hundreds and hundreds of unsaved people to come and hear the gospel in this building that God has given them. Let's pray. That that happens. Lift up your voices, friends. Bobomeni is one of our sites. Lord, we thank you for the miracle of this building. We thank you for the provision that has come to provide this piece of land, this house, these buildings on the side and in this hall. And we pray this weekend, Lord God, that hundreds and hundreds of unchurched people would come in, that they wouldn't have even room enough to fit. We pray, Lord, they'll be sitting on the outside. That as the the guy who preaches, preaches the word, that many, many would be saved. And this would be the beginning of a revival in that place, Lord God. And that from and Popo many, from this building, that other buildings would be uh, planted and other churches would be set up. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
friends, probably nothing, everything we pray for, God hears. But I think the prayer that probably touches God's heart more than anything else when we ask Him for help is when we pray and say, God and people get saved. I want us to lift our voices and I want us to pray for our city right now and for multitudes to get saved. Lord Jesus, we pray for our city. We pray for our schools. We pray for our workplaces. We pray that you are going to just bring salvation into the city of ours, Lord Jesus. Father, we pray that those that don't know you, Holy Spirit, draw them. Holy Spirit, open their eyes to see you. Holy Spirit, open their hearts that they will, that they will call on you, Lord Jesus, and you will save them. Father, we pray for salvation. We pray that you move in power. We pray that you do what only you can do in Jesus' name. One last uh, thing we're going to pray for.